I would say, can we change it so you care about it? So do you show us a say? Okay. Now, look at their energy, look at their body. It changes. So this is what I want you to learn how to be. To be in touch with your own journey and connect with your, <coughs> your self and each other. So there's an intra-psychic change followed by an interactive change. So that's the second thing I would like you to learn, is that the, intra the constant, the change process is an internal change before an external change. Judah, I know you're single, but she's married, so... I'm not going too far. <laughs> The only, the, only, the only thing to her is, you have good taste. <laughs> I know. You know. <laughs> you. Julia is my full-time... <laughs> Julia is my full-time staff member in China. Full-time. Working on spreading people's uh, knowledge. And one of the things that Chinese really like is to get in touch with their own self. Because in their culture, in the last hundred years, that has not been an encouraged kind of thing. So they are very eager to learn who they are. So, what are we then talking about? We want to talk about the uh, idea of who we really are first. So maybe we'll skip a few of these and go to, uh, to who we are. So I want to tell you a story that I heard. This is also a true story. So I want to use it to capture your interest in finding out how to do therapy in this modern age. Okay, there, that's good. So there was this scientist, a real scientist, who was not very communicative with the world. And so he would have a telephone. And this telephone would basically say, ask, say, ask two questions. And the two questions he would ask, which you will all know, is who are you? And secondly, what is it you want? Because as I say, he was a scientist and he didn't really want to talk to too many people. So he had this little telephone working, and he would say, you know, the telephone, you would phone him, and he would say, who are you, and what do you want? And then he would stop for a little minute, or a second, and then he said, most people, most people die before they even answer one of those questions. Okay, so I want to warn you that most people will die before they will have answered one of these questions. So then we want to take a look at who are you? If most of you, most of you will be, but in general, most of you will have some sense of who are you? And what is it you want? And so with that attitude then, I go into my couple's therapy, is who are you? And what is it you want? And so Satir came up with a metaphor. Chinese like metaphors. So maybe we steal the whole idea of metaphors from them. Because if you read their Chinese literature, especially their poetry, it is just filled with metaphors. So we have this metaphor. And I want to introduce you to yourself in terms of this metaphor. So I will start at the bottom part that most of us know least, and it's called the I am, the self. Sometimes we just call it the self. Um, in here we have it, the I am, the spirit, the soul, the life force, the core, the being part. And so in therapy now, we want to be more interested in helping people at the being part, not the doing part, or not just the feeling part, but the being part. And so we need to find out a way for us to be before we can really help others to be. <coughs> so that becomes a big exploration 
in the therapeutic journey to help people to become more in tune with who they are at the level of spirit. I have a little say here, if I can find it, in terms of what Virginia Satir said. Maybe I can read you one thing. It says this, my personal idea and understanding of spirituality began with my own experience as a child growing up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, USA. Everywhere I saw growing things. Very early I understood that growth was life force revealing itself, a manifestation of spirit. It is the realization that we are spiritual beings in human form. This is the essence of spirituality. The challenge of becoming more fully human is to be open to and to contact that power we very many times call by many names. God is one of those names we frequently use. I believe that successful living depends on our making and our accepting relationships to our own life force. So in our therapeutic journey, we want to look at that aspect of life. And we call those, to fulfill those aspects of life, she has called them yearnings, that we will meet our own yearnings. You know, Maslow talked about psychological needs, she talks about them as positively directional yearnings. And those are not some examples here acceptance, belonging, creativity, connection, freedom. We have lots more to add to, I see, missing love, being loved, as part of the yearnings. They are our requirements, if you like, a part of us growing up or becoming fully human, so that we will need them in terms of doing that. <clears throat> but what is seen to be missing in your picture is our expectations. Do you have them somewhere? Um, no. Okay. We need a, another component. So if you can imagine, in terms of this iceberg, there's a whole layer of expectations that are there. Those expectations come from outside, they come from inside. And very often, we have unmet expectations. So when people come to you, they will have this idea that we have not met our expectation. They usually manifest themselves in terms of, of uh, uh, reactions. I didn't get what I want, so I react to it. So you take a whole look at in between perception and yearning, we need a whole section there called expectation. Expectation I have of myself, expectation I have of you, expectation you have of me. And if you look at couples therapy, you will very, very often find that the struggle is that we have unmet expectation that we need to look at so that we can fulfill those expectations in terms of doing something about it. So your model has five ways of doing that, we're not going to talk about, we're not going to teach you that today. But just take a look at, when some couple comes to you and they are unhappy, they are either angry, they are sad, they are afraid, whatever their reaction is, take a look at a little deeper and see what are their unmet expectations. And as Susan Johnson, I think, said so well yesterday, if you have unmet expectation, you then will come across as some kind of complaint or some kind of reaction to the people. And if she can put it into more positive terms, moving the expectation into yearnings, then you'll find that you can have, have these met. So expectations are an important <coughs> voice, an important sign. So you don't just listen to what they're feeling. Our feelings are usually a reaction to unmet expectations. So when people come and tell me all about their feelings, I would rather go deeper and find out what are the unmet expectations that are controlling or driving your reactive feeling 
that you can now change if you can face your unbound expectation. Then part of you, who you are, of course, are your beliefs, your thoughts, your ideas, your values. And most of you know a lot about that part. It, it very often then becomes an attempt. So some therapists then say, we will try to teach, change your perception. Let's do a perceptual change. Let's change your cognition, your thinking. And therefore you might be happier. Well, that's partially true, but more important for us is that you're looking inside and say, well, how can I meet my yearnings in such a way that I can satisfy myself, the only inner self part. And then we have feelings, feelings of joy, feelings of anger. And we look at feelings as a secondary response to some unmet expectation and yearnings. And therefore, we will say one of the things that Sifirin has taught us so well is that feelings belong to you. So if you can put that into your heart, feelings belong to you. Feelings aren't you, feelings belong to you. And if feelings belong to you, then you can learn how to manage them. You can learn how to enjoy them. You can learn how to be in charge of them. So if you are living in this life energy level at the bottom of the iceberg, then you would have a sense of meeting your yearning. And therefore, you could be in charge of your feeling. So part of our, our goal then, in terms of secure therapeutic results, is how how much you are in charge of what is there, inside. But there is an addition to it, which is sort of still, I don't think, very common, and it's how do you feel about your feeling? How do you feel about your feeling? And how can you look at that? Because when you feel something, very often your perception triggers in, and you have a judgment about your feeling. So could you also look at feelings about of feelings? So if I feel angry, I might feel ashamed. Or if I feel angry, I might be afraid. How can you help your client look at feelings about feelings and see how they can then make some changes about them? And then part of the iceberg here is our stances, you know the placating stance, you know the blaming stance, you know the super reasonable stance. And if we have time, which we probably don't, we can show you that in more detail. And then at the top of the iceberg is our actions, our behavior, our story. Story, talk therapy. Most therapy still seems to depend very much on talk therapy. And so at our level, third level of the stages, we're not talking now anymore about talk therapy. What is, uh, how do I feel, but we're talking about how do I change so I can meet my yearning. What do you have next? I have stances next. Okay. Let me Let's leave that and go to... Elements? Okay, let's go to our... Five elements. Okay, let's do a little therapy in terms of that. We need five essential elements for transformational change to take place. So we have, the first one is that all our therapy needs to be experiential. And some people have had very difficult things. So now we're moving into from talk therapy to emoting therapy to experiential therapy. I'm experiencing myself in the present. I experience myself in the present. That's experiential therapy. Whatever you're doing, you're having the person engage in their own life energy experience. And now sometimes you think if somebody that cries, that's experiential. And of course it's experiential. But there's a lot of other signs. And one of the big signs that you heard from both of your speakers so far 
is that the body speaks as much as your head does. And that you can listen to your body and have the body experience the session. And so you want to connect or you want to engage the body's experience so that you have a more fuller, maybe more honest too, experience of the person by asking them what their body is saying, what their body sensations are, what their body is is holding back, what the body is communicating. So an experiential component for us is a must. Otherwise it becomes a cognitive aspect or an emotive concept or a behavior concept and we're not engaging the whole person at any length. The second thing we can look at is systemic in this little graph. Well, systemic, we have basically two systemic systems going on at the same time. One is the system of the family or the couple or the family of origin. We take a look at the family as a system and most of you have a good sense of that, I hope. And secondly, you have a system of the iceberg. Each time something works, that part comes to the surface. It triggers. It's like a, like a mobile. The system of the inside is very important. So if I want something, I think something, I do something, I feel something, all that is very systemic. And it's like, you know, having a violin and playing, playing four, four, uh, four strings. And they combine, and how they follow each other is what creates the music. We have the same with the iceberg. If you follow the iceberg internally, you will find out they all play together. Sometimes that one note plays much louder than the other. And very often we listen to that note instead of listening to the more quiet note that's there. And so systemic is an important element of transformational change. And all of it is change focused. We always want to help them change. So there's a being and becoming going on at the same time. How can I be and how can I become? Have you thought of that paradox of being at the same time and becoming at the same time in your therapeutic aspect? How can you validate your client where they are at and how can you help them change from where they are at, at the same time? And I think it's very possible but it's sometimes we are so busy listening to where they're at and we don't talk about change or we're so busy changing we're making them feel guilty of who they are. So we want to make sure we can have a sense of being and becoming. So change focus. And all our change is based meeting our life energy so it's all positively driven. Our goals then become positively driven. In the simplest form, it's how do I meet my yearnings? Now in couples therapy, there's some kind of disagreement, so let me tell you our picture. Our picture is that it's the responsibility of the individual to meet their yearnings. It's not the responsibility of my mate to meet my yearnings. So let's make that as a point for you. The first responsibility is to help your client meet his own yearning. Then with the two people being responsible meeting their yearning, they then can connect and help each other, support each other. But we don't put the onus on the other person, the mate's person, to meet your own yearning or to meet their own needs or to meet their own emotional kind of aspect of it. So there is some, uh, some responsibility component at the interpsychic level before we can really work on the interactive level. So we're sequencing internal responsibility before we really establish a new kind of resp responsibility of interactive thing. So sequencing interpsychic to interactive. Maybe some family systems a long time ago, they were only interested in the interactive system because they wanted to get away from the psychology part. And the psychologists, of course, were so interested in only working with the individual 
that the two almost like, like they were in conflict with each other. The Satir model has put them together in a sequential kind of way. So change focus is from the inside out. You know, if you read um, a, um, a book called From the Inside Out by, um, what's the name of it? Yeah. You might find out that it's very simple, uh, very strong, straightforward. And the fifth aspect is the use of self. Everyone is talking about this use of self. Well, the use of self is how do I use my life energy, first of all, to connect with myself in therapy. The satir used to call this preparation. How do you prepare yourself? in terms of doing that. How do you prepare yourself in the long run? And there's lots of ways to do that, meditation being one of them. So you could create a way of meeting yourself in terms of doing that. Or you can enjoy music or nature, or you might even have some friends who can have the impact of you connecting with your own life energy. Then you want to know and connect with the life energy of your client, even though they are most often disconnected or they're very slightly connected with it. And so you want to help them be more connected with their own life energy. Then you want to look at how, what is in the way for them to experience themselves in a full on way. And then you can go all the way from childhood, unfinished business, to present unfinished business, working through some of the hurts, some of the disappointments, some of the uh, anger, some of the perceptions. In Chinese, the big perception is, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough. And so how can you change that kind of perception so that they can connect with their, I'm lovable and I'm worthwhile, so that they can do that. So you connect with your own life energy, use of self, to connect and believe in the life energy of your client, help them connect with theirs, work out something that's in the way. So there are the five sort of elements that we need, that we teach in the Satir model, how to bring about transformational change. What's your next one? Okay, so now sometimes this gets to be a little interesting because we say to uh, our clients, our students, that we already have some goals for your client. We haven't seen your client yet, but we will give you some of the goals that you will work on. And some of the schools say, how can you, how dare you, how can you be so arrogant that you can decide what kind of goals you will have for your clients? And they say, well, let's just look at them first. Let's take a look at what are the universal meta goals that we would like to work for with everyone. And one of them is, we want to have everybody raise their self-esteem. Any client that comes, any couple that comes, I will have that as my goal. But before we go further, let me define self-esteem. As I was saying yesterday, self-esteem is in disrespect in the United States right now. And there's some real strong arguments about self-esteem attempts in schools has utterly failed. And yet Satir model is still pushing self-esteem as a meta goal. So what's happening? What is wrong with self-esteem? And maybe some of you have already discovered that self-esteem was tied to how you feel not who you are. And if you lose self-esteem as a feeling result, then all you have to do is take some Prozac and you will have a good sense of feeling better. So in terms of Satir model, we have looked at self-esteem as a state of being. How much you are in harmony with yourself at the level of your own life energy. So we're keeping the idea of self-esteem. We're just making sure that people hear our definition of self-esteem. And secondly, we want to make a bigger choice maker. 
people who have listened to Satya very often say, oh, she always gave us three choices. You always have to give us three choices. So a couple comes to you and they complain how terrible and unhappy you are, and they say to you, you say to you, well, you have three choices. They said, no, we don't. And I said, yeah, we have three choices. Let's look at what those choices are. And they are like this. This is how I teach them. One of the choices is to be, to stay miserable. That's a choice. A lot of people, some of your parents, they stayed together, but they were miserable. Okay, so that's one choice. Second choice is to get a divorce. A lot of people do that. So that's another choice. And then they say, and what's the third choice? To make it better, to meet your yearnings, yourself and each other's. So then they say, is that the only choices? And I said, no, there are lots more. I said, give us more. And I say, well, one of them is you can kill yourself. Just commit suicide. That's another choice. Oh, no, I wouldn't do that. Well, another choice is to kill him. That would be another choice. <laughs> and then they say, well, maybe working on making it better is the best choice. But very often we need to look at the possibility of choices before we can really decide where to go. And some of them you bring about choices that are not quite compatible with their own belief system, but just to have them consider, why well, you can kill yourself. The best experience I had about this was when I was in Hong Kong University. I was teaching how to commit, uh, how to prevent suicide because in Hong Kong suicide is a big public thing because most suicides in Hong Kong are people jumping from high towers or buildings. And so the neighborhood always knows that there is a, a suicide. In the United States, most suicides are killing themselves by a gun, they shoot themselves. In Hong Kong, they jump. So the university was very interested in helping them uh, 